Hello, everyone. This is Tanya, your cancer holistic cancer wellness specialist. Today on Power Pantaloons podcast, we have Leslie Grant, and she is, is it functional medicine? Functional nutrition. Functional. I was close. I was very close. Very close. Well, welcome. Please tell everybody what you do, Leslie. Okay. Well, thank you, Tanya. Uh, so what I do is, it's interesting. I I think when I, in this conversation, I want to talk about how I help women that are anywhere on that menopause spectrum, get a handle on what's happening, you know, in their bodies, in their lives, in, in their communities, in their worlds. Uh, and I do that by using, you know, nutrition, obviously, because I have a functional nutrition background. Uh, I also am a, a behavior coach and uh, I huge amounts of support. I've co-founded um, uh, something called the Women's Health Allegiance with Dr. Emily Haber. We work together here in uh, North Vancouver, Canada, and that is uh, community medicine. So we run a couple of programs uh, twice a year, probably where uh, we bring you know menopause onto the stage, and we really help women make sense of it. Fantastic. First of all, we I could talk about nutrition all day long, because I think it's the second most important thing uh, when you're when you're getting yourself together. Number one is mindset. You have to get your mind right first and then then work on your nutrition. And then everything else is is bonus as far as I'm concerned. Well, whatever wellness path you're on, whether you're dealing with with cancer or some other diagnosis or just having uh, difficulty with your uterus behaving in a way you don't want it to. <laughs> <laughs> yes 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 absolutely uh, well you know for me it, it was uh overnight menopause when they mm. when, when they removed the, the the uterus i at 38 here we are ta-da and i fully expected all kinds of crazy stuff to go with it um uh, but i i guess i got a big old break because i was dealing with cancer so i I didn't really feel any of that except the whole radicalness of not having a uterus and then having to rediscover my fem feminine self because my feminine self tried to murder me. So mm -hmm. it had to be gone, right? Like, and, and that's a whole different piece. Like first you deal with cancer and then suddenly you're, not a woman anymore because you don't have a uterus what I, I like I think that's a ridiculous statement right like there is a divinity in it in it but it, it has nothing to do with your sexual organs and that's a soapbox for another day so let's talk about <laughs> there are so many soapboxes I could stand at so let's talk about nutrition and where somebody would start Okay. All right. So, you know, you said some really interesting things and definitely that is a conversation for another day, but just to clear up one of the misconceptions about hormones is, you know, we have hundreds of hormones that do multiple jobs and, uh, you know, progesterone, estrogen, testosterone, those are like, you know, the sex hormones and they are responsible for, you know, reproduction for, you know, for things that sort of align up with like feminine um, uh, hormones, but there's, you know, having a, a hysterectomy or having your uterus taken out doesn't necessarily mean that you're no longer, you know, hormonal. A lot of women just sort of think, oh, I don't have hormones anymore, which is not the case. Um, they're just different. Yeah, they're just different. You, you uh, the body is really, uh, smart at creating new pathways and finding ways to, uh, kind of like steal from Peter to pay Paul in order to always try to maintain balance and homeostasis. And so, uh, you know, our, our biggest sort of primal goal is survival at all costs. And, and you can see that in, you know, sort of the state of some human bodies that are, are very uh, much pushed to extremes, like the severely obese or the severely anorexic, um, uh, you know, people that are, that have addictions, like, you know, that body wants to survive and it will do whatever it, it, can so yeah, yeah. yeah. so that again like you said it's another topic for another day but you know if we were to talk about nutrition uh you know generally speaking across the board 
Uh, nutrition is actually quite simple. Uh, we have made it very, very complicated uh, because somewhere along the line, it was discovered that, hey, there's some money to be made here. A uh, billion dollar diet industry, a self-help industry is testament to that. Yeah. Uh, and if, That's if a, also a different soapbox, right? Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, the more kind of chaos and confusion and rabbit holes, uh, especially that women can find themselves in generally leads to, you know, a state of uh, either being rendered, you know, frozen and not really knowing what the next step to do is. And while they're thinking about what the next step to take is, they're just going to have like a bag of Doritos. Um, or, you know, they're trying one diet or the next diet or the next diet and they're extremes, like, you know, they're, they're very extreme. So my work really focuses on uh, bringing a body back into balance. And nutrition is one of the very first places that I like to start. Um, I don't like diets at all. I, I, I call it a lifestyle change. Mm. And I feel that in order for it to be maintainable, you have to do it in small increments and, and get used to the new thing and then just keep adding better things for you over over the course of time yeah. and I've I've had I've been battling with my weight since dirt but I finally am on the right path and uh is over 60 pounds now so I, I just <laughs> and it, it it has been incremental changes and we don't use the word exercise in the house because exercise is a punishment. We use the word recreation because recreation is something I want to do. And it's fun. So there's recreation events and not exercise. I love that. That is awesome. Yes, that's exactly what it is, right? You you shape uh, the world that you want to live in. And it's mindset. It, it's yes. absolutely, it starts with mindset. It ends with mindset. How you look at it is is how your body is going to respond to it. it and it you know if you all the negative self talk that you give yourself it's mm. why you're where you're at yes. and i know it's super hard to get out of that 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 cycle is vicious and it takes it takes work and and some of us aren't ready for the work yet yeah i mean i think it takes de definitely it takes work but you know I'm just going to talk about women for right now, because, you know, yes. really, we have been at the mercy of massive marketing budgets and generations of, you know, if we keep women, the idea is if I, I believe if women are kept like small and skinny and hungry and, you know, in, in case like not really able to fight back, then that's a really great place for for women to live. Um, I mean, that's a really general broad strokes there, but covers of different... magazines yeah it's again it's a oh, oh yeah like that that's a soapbox i could stand on as well like yeah i if if we don't know how to take care of ourselves because they've confused us so much we can't be an empowered group of people mm -hmm. um speaking up for ourselves and fighting for our rights yeah yeah that's exactly what it is and you know there is uh you know of course the prevailing diet culture is be skinny and everybody wants to have like, you know, most women have been conditioned to think that there's just one body shape and one body size and the rest of them uh, are bad or wrong or, you know, something that we don't, that's not right. We're shamed into thinking, well, if we can't be a size six, then what's wrong with us? Uh, it's kind of like, you know, if your foot is a size eight, but you want it to be a size six, there's you could will and you could diet and you could work very hard at trying to make your foot a size six, but that is just not going to happen because genetically yeah. you're not designed for that. But if we're going to talk about clothes size, what is a size six? If this brand, a size six is this, and, and over here it's a size eight and over here it's a size four, like that's part of the confusion too. And all this shit is done on purpose and it really, mm. yeah. Yeah. yeah, like it's yeah. very irritating as 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 a woman to to try and figure out even even, and that's part of the design confusion as far as I'm concerned. Just keep us always guessing what's going on. I, I shop in the men's clothes, like I, I wear men's pants and stuff now because because I can go in and I get exactly what's going to fit me without like all the extra mental gymnastics I have to do to figure out if this dumb pair of pants is going to fit me. It's ridiculous. Exactly, exactly. And the freedom that comes 
once, uh, you know, once you have a, a place for that to live. So, you know, one of the things that I work on when I'm working with clients is the idea of expanding outwards versus shrinking down and getting smaller, right? And so you had said something earlier about adding to, right? So the idea of when I talk about nutrition, so we're talking about expansion versus shrinking, when I, you know, bringing this conversation back to nutrition, when I talk about building a plate, which is where I start with everybody, um, it's there, you know, there are basically three things that essentially need to be on a plate. And that is protein, quality fat, and complex carbohydrates. And once and it's almost too simple. Like there's not a lot of money to be made off of that message. Like my book is literally like a post-it note. This is my book, protein, carbohydrates, and quality fat. You know, it's a dollar. Great. Buy it. I don't have a big, crazy, uh, you know, um, complicated measuring of and taking away of this and timing of that storyline entering into uh, just a balanced plate. That's your home base. And once, once uh, you know, women start to eat this way, which is like adding to, so make sure you have enough protein, make sure you have two tablespoons of fat with every meal. And when I say, sorry, back to protein, when I say enough protein, I mean, protein with every meal, you know, I shoot for 30 grams of protein. That is just not a message that women have gotten maybe ever. Same with the complex carbohydrates. Like that is the stuff that your body totally gets and knows what to do with every single bite of it. So I'm over here trying to figure out how much 30 grams is in ounces. Ah, uh, uh, let me see. Uh, if, you know, I don't even, if to make it even simpler, just go for your palm, right? So if you have like a palm, a chicken, I don't know, that's going to be probably 30 grams more or less, like just eat more protein, get some, get, no, throw hemp seeds, three tablespoons of hemp seeds is going to be 10 grams of protein. Oh, Add oh, that to nuts, your oatmeal. Nuts are amazing. Yeah, good. You're going to get great. Nuts. Yes. Exactly. So, but there's this idea that, you know, and one of the biggest challenges that I have when I, when I start working with women is they're like, well, I'm here to lose weight. That's generally, you know, one of the, one of the main, main goals of a, a program. And, uh, you know, th then I will respond with, well, I don't run a weight loss program actually. So, but what I do run is a getting your body back into balance program and weight loss happens to be one of the amazing side effects. If that's meant for you, right? If that's meant for you, then that's what will happen. But we, what we focus on really is bringing in, you know, um, the raw materials. So, you know, food is medicine, food is information, food is basically raw materials, which, w which the body will, you know, break down, digest, assimilate and use to create cellular actions, new pathways, all the gorgeous things that a body needs to like wake up in the morning, move through the day, have energy, you know, have a good poop, uh, go to sleep. Remember, remember where you put your keys. Like those are kind of the basic things. And food is one of the key drivers of that. Yes. 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 I, and, and hydration, uh, you know, yes. what, like 70% of Americans are always dehydrated. I, I mean, yeah. It, it's, it's kind of insane to think about it, but when, when you're drinking coffee to start your day and, and caffeine is a diuretic, I, you know, you're already starting at a, a negative balance because you just woke up. And then the first thing you put in your body is, and I'm guilty of it. I'm absolutely guilty of it, but yeah. So how do you calculate? Cause there's so many different ways or so many different things you hear about exactly how much water you're supposed to be drinking. So how do you calculate that? So if you can calculate, let's just say this is a really simple formula that I like to use. So let's just say if you are like kind of up and around and functioning for about 10 hours, right? In a day, like, I don't know, from the morning, from the time you wake up until you sort of come home from work, a glass of water an hour, you know, just try to get, try to get that in. Uh, water is, yes. I mean, it, you know, hydration is um, really critical for uh, the, the obvious things. Um uh, one of the things that, you know, when I talk about cellular functioning that, you know, food is basically helps cells do their jobs, water and hydration helps cells communicate. So it enables them to communicate with each other underwater. Like, you know, how hard it is to talk underwater. Yeah. 
So unless, unless you know sign language and then it's easier. Yeah. Yeah. But, but so, you know, like cells can't, will communicate best underwater. So it's the opposite of what we do. Like we can't talk underwater. They can't actually talk without water. Let's put it that way. They need yeah. that kind of lava lamp, like, you know, and the other thing too, it's sort of like, if you think of a lava lamp versus like a dry desert, right? So the more sort of hydrated you are, just the better you're going to be able to move your body. Yeah. More fluid. Yeah. More fluid. Yeah. You're going to be literally more fluid. Yeah. And yeah. you know, if you, if you wake up in the morning, uh, one, another trick is just to have a glass of water by, by your bed. And the minute you put your feet on the floor, the first thing you're going to do is say, today is going to be a great day. The second thing you're going to do is just drink that glass of water that was meant for first thing in the morning and then go have your coffee. You know, while you have your coffee, try, if you can sip that coffee while you're looking out a window into the light. These are kinds of like little secrets that sort of help yeah, bring yeah. you into your day. You get your, your, your vitamin nutrition from the, from the, the first light. From the first light. It just tells your body, Hey, it's time to wake up. You know, your, your, uh, cortisol rising. will be like, oh, cool. It's first thing in the morning. Even if it's dark outside, you know, at least if you're sort of looking to where the sun is rising, it, that sort of gives you, um, uh, like a kind of a, a North star, so to speak. Yeah. A, a guide, a guidance for your day. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Yeah. I love the little hacks because, because they, they make a difference when you tell yourself you're going to have a good day, you're setting your intention or sending your attention as, as, as I learned from Donna at last episode. Right. So instead of setting the intention, send it out there. Like mm -hmm. once you make it, you also have to be, push it out into the universe so that, so that it's sending the message to the universe that that's what you want. So absolutely I love these chats. I love these chats because I get to, I get to learn new stuff and mm -hmm. I get to help other people learn new stuff. Absolutely. And nutrition is such a huge, like, it's such a massive, <clears throat> excuse me, like silo, like, where do you even begin? And so narrowing it down, keeping things really simple, <clears throat> excuse me. Here's one thing. This is one thing that, you know, you can all think about. So <clears throat> if you were to take an apple, right, straight up apple, eat that apple, your body's going to be like, dude, got it. I know what to do with every single thing that this apple has provided me. You know, there's soluble and insoluble fiber. It's like 23 trace elements. There's tons of great vitamins and minerals. Uh, you know, and it's there's nothing in the apple where your body goes, whoa, I don't know what to do with that. I'm a little confused. Uh, take a Dorito, for example. All right, well, maybe your body's like, mm, okay, I see there's a little bit of corn in there, maybe, um, but and uh, there's some sodium, but there's not really a lot that I understand. Yeah, However, body, what is this? Yeah, your body is going to exactly. It's like, what is this? However, it will do its very best to break down and process and assimilate and eliminate whatever is in that Dorito chip. So, uh, you know, the the thing that we're where we land is the people that make the Doritos, the Frito-Lay people have a bajillion dollar budget. And they can afford all of the messaging in the world that is going to tell us things like, well, this has got, you know, these extra added vitamins and minerals. And maybe the Dorito isn't exactly the perfect example of that, but we could take a box of cereal as an example. Same idea, right? It's, it's organic. It's, uh, you know, low fat. It is made with, you know, all natural ingredients, et cetera, et cetera. And more often than not, that's enough for people. We'll just read the box and believe it and be like, great. Well, this, because the packaging says it's good for me. I'm going to believe it. Uh, it would be lovely if we in this society could actually believe what's on the packaging. Like, I don't understand why there are laws out there that allow it to be the way it is. That it, it's just so ridiculous. Mm. It, we should be able to trust what's on the box. And, and, and now they're doing all these studies on, on, on vitamins and supplements and what it says it's in there. It just, it's not. And, and, I'm not ah. a guinea pig. I'm not yes. a guinea pig. That's right. Knock it the fuck off. Like yes. I it's very frustrating that that we're treated like guinea pigs and cash cows. Exactly. And that is the business of hyper processed food, right? Again, so go back to the apple, 
right? So Apple Farmer here versus Frito-Lay Company. Apple Farmer is like probably up at dawn, you know, crashing into bed at desk, totally exhausted, can barely afford a cardboard sign that says 99 cents a pound or whatever it is for an apple. You know, like it's not a fair fight. And no, it's, not. it's not a fair fight. There's a really great book that just come out, has come out. I can't remember the author, but it's called Ultra Processed Human. And it's this ultra processing of food, like removing a food from its whole state and basically turning it into a Franken food, a food that doesn't even recognize itself anymore. It's like, I don't know, I started out in the cornfield and now I'm like covered in all of this like sparkle dust and I'm in a plastic bag and I'm in a cardboard box and I'm on a transport to, you know, Alaska. Like it's, it's, it's not food. Uh, but there is, you know, a bottom line. There's a huge, there's a bottom line, um, for the producers of foods that uh, really make up most of the shelves in North America. And uh, one way to uh, get people to consume them is to make claims that speak to uh, an easier wet approach to getting all the vitamins and minerals and, and you know believing in health claims that will make our lives easier and, and, and make us healthy. We should be able to treat, we should be able to trust that our government has our best interests at heart. And and we we don't at this point. We just we cannot. If we're any kind of intelligent, we we absolutely cannot. And it's it's super frustrating because we should be. But I, you know, that's another soapbox that I could just stand on and 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 scream about. Um totally, totally. And it's a pen, like, you know, it, really the bottom line for a lot of these huge corporations is um, you know, the pensions. Like, well, how how much money are we making here? And that's like, you know, Michael Pollan, who uh, wrote a really great little book called Food Rules, one of his amazing quotes to me is, you know, uh, we left, we fled the kitchen and we now let corporations make our food choices for us. And that's our first mistake. So my 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 push is to get us back into the kitchen and to dumb it all down and keep it very, very simple and just go for foods in their whole most original state as close to their original state. And that is a no brainer. There's, there's no question that you will win. There's no question. If you like pick up a, I don't know, a potato, a carrot, like two of the most demonized vegetables, a banana, you know, great. Eat the potato, eat the carrot. I don't care if it's high starch. I don't care if it's got extra sugar in it. It's going to beat the crap out it's of actually real food. It's actually real food. Yeah. Yeah. And it possesses, uh, you know, vitamins and minerals and trace elements of all the gorgeous things that help these bodies move through life. And that's really where we got derailed. That's where, where things went sideways as we started depending on processing. And uh, hence, you know, that then leads to all of the illnesses. So if we talk about, you know, you, you obviously cancer is, is a big, uh, important, uh, you know, uh, subject for you. And, you know, when I, when I work with people that are working, I work preventatively and, you know, there's this thing, there's this, this talk about, well, cancer, sugar leads to cancer. And there hasn't actually been, you know, the science isn't in on that specific claim. However, inflammation, obesity, those are, there are direct links to a multitude of diseases that come yeah. from simply having too much added sugar in your daily diet, right? And so really, if I'm looking at bringing, you know, someone back or, or up the slope of health back towards more optimal health, the number one thing that I want to do is I want to really start to reduce inflammation. And the way that I do that is to take a really good look at like, okay, well, how much sugar are you actually consuming? And there are over 50 names for sugar. It's a tricky business, right? You're going to find sugar in your toothpaste. Sugar is in your wallpaper glue for crying out loud. Like it's, it's pretty pervasive. I'm not licking my wallpaper though. Well, yeah. <laughs> Thank goodness. We'll leave that up to your cats. <laughs> Oh, God. Yeah. <laughs> leave it to my puppy so i yeah. uh, we're gonna do a little tree branch right here so it, you, you know we get the big bags of sugar right because we're ridiculous at, at the time uh we had like six people in the house so we don't at this point but we, we would buy the 25 pound bag of sugar and i i walked through the kitchen i'm like what am i stepping on well, the dog had licked through the 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 paper so he could help himself to to sugar he's 
addicted to sugar and opened the whole bag. So that had to go in the garbage. But like, it's not just us that are addicted to sugar. Oh my God. Absolutely. Yes. I mean, sugar is really, you know, I think there, I read a a little piece recently about how like upon the discovery of sugar, you know, it was sent like in one of those Russian doll, like lock and key, lock and key into the very like tiny little sugar cube uh, with a little note that said at all costs under zero circumstances, should this substance ever hit the general public. Uh, It was sent from one King to another, like, Hey, look what I found, you know, but it's, it's the kind of thing that, um, and it's obvious, like immediately, it's just going to light up that dopamine and it's just going to send us on like sugar hunts for easily for the rest of our lives. And uh, there's no, people, we don't have a problem, you know, feeding this to our kids and starting them early. It's just, we might as well just be giving them some cigarettes at the same time, you know. What I find interesting is over the course of the last couple of years, my my taste buds have definitely changed, I, you know, and sometimes what I, I don't do it very often, but if I have a, a very sugary beverage or a sugary thing, it, it doesn't hit like it used to hit. It's actually gross now, which mm. I, which I take as a sign of, of, of goodness, right? Like, and it makes me very happy. So obviously I'm, I'm, I'm staying away from that, but that was not an easy process. And we're going to go back to like in, incremental changes to get there. Diets don't work because this, the second you come off of them, you're right back to your, your old habits. And, and it, that's not going to help. You have to decide that you're changing your lifestyle. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Ups, and then you have to be committed to it. And I'm like doing something radical overnight is, is not the way to go because you're used to all of that. And you're not going to stick to it. But if instead of, you know, two cups of coffee, you go down to one and a half cups of coffee and then, then one cup of coffee and then half a cup of coffee. And now you're drinking water and mud water, all these other, Mm -hmm. like, you know, uh, herbal and uh, mushroom based coffee substitute type things that are absolutely delicious right and way better for you so it's little steps you know oh 100 percent. another another thing that i like to say as well is you know you have to major in the minors right you cannot skip the small steps and that is that is generally also where we have a tendency to go wrong or get thrown off track is like okay well i'm gonna quit coffee Okay, well, that's a huge, massive, enormous statement and step and probably destined for failure because if you're starting at four cups a day and you're just going to cut quick cold turkey, uh, like you say, you know, that's not a small step. That's a giant leap and probably right off a cliff because you're going to be cranky and you're going to have cravings and et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. So do major in the minors as well as, you know, um, I feel like what my, one of the the platforms that I like to stand on is this whole ditch diet culture, you know, like once we start to think, realize how we've been duped and how we've been preyed upon and the messaging that has basically occupied so much space, once we free up that space and we stop filling it with all the negative thoughts and that, that sort of, you know, that shame spiral that we can very easily go into and we have this freedom the option now is to fill it with whatever you want. What do you want to fill that space with? Right. So maybe it is like you said, it's mindset stuff, right? So, Oh, okay. Well, now I'm going to start feeling good about myself. Absolutely. So like what I've been drinking over here is I, I love kombucha, but I can't drink straight kombucha. It's a little, it's a little much for me. So I started with kombucha, cranberry juice and ginger ale. And a week ago, we 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 decided we're done with the ginger ale, and now we're doing teas. So I grabbed some rosemary from the the supermarket and and threw it in a pot and made a gallon of rosemary tea, and and it was delicious, right? And now we have peppermint downstairs. I brewed it this morning, and not only is it cheaper than the soda, it's way better for my body, and the combinations. There's so many different kinds of. Uh, 
kombucha out there. So like every time I make a beverage, it's a different flavor. So it keeps me interested in the activity. And it's not sweet and great. That's a yeah. those are gorgeous tips. I'm gonna take those tips actually, because that is uh that's exactly what um the kind of stuff that we're talking about, right? Like you are in the driver's seat. And it's important to you to make these small in incremental changes over time. And, you know, the kombucha and the cranberry juice and the ginger ale, I mean, immediately when you said ginger ale, I went a little bit like, okay, ginger ale, <laughs> struggle a bit about that. But then that's the first thing to go. And you found this great swap and you're more than happy with it. Right. Because before it was straight soda. And, right. and, 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 and so I, w so I transitioned, I left the soda in there but I added cranberry juice and I add, added the kombucha and I did that for four or five months. Mm -hmm. And then we we stepped our game up and now we're doing iced tea instead. And it's delicious. And it it's it's still, I don't, I don't feel like I'm missing the fizz or the whatever from the soda. Because if I really need to do that, I can make my own ginger ginger beer out of you know like out of ginger and champagne yeast and whatever like and I can have the fizzy if I want it mm -hmm. but I, I don't I don't need to do that because that's not why I'm drinking it so you yeah. know so it's what it's it's, it, it's it's what works for you and it is the small steps so instead of going straight to a tart beverage from coca-cola I built a bridge a little and 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 did a little step by step and I figured out what worked for me and what I didn't like and I tried four or five different kombuchas and and I found the one that worked for me and all the prebiotics girl like there you go yeah it's little steps I I don't I don't eat much uh processed white bread nonsense stuff anymore uh, I've been perfecting my uh, casserole dish activity. I'll, I'll throw in whatever vegetables I want, a, a little bit of olive oil on the bottom to make sure nothing sticks. The cheese I'm interested in having in it, and your varieties here are just absolutely endless. And then I'll throw a, a lean protein on top and then just bake it and stir it. All your seasonings and 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 just nutritious and delicious and I don't feel like I'm missing anything and yeah. that's 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 the part you have to figure out what you can do to make your little changes so that you're not missing the thing and that's why it's important to do the small changes because I got here from little changes you know we went from too much mashed potatoes on the plate or bread or rolls or wraps or whatever to well now now I'm eating all of my sandwich type stuff in romaine boats not all of it but like most of the time so I'll have a, a wrap once a week twice a week but not every day anymore and you still get your texture difference with the romaine like romaine is an amazing bread substitute oh, I even amazing the young yeah. man doing it like you know the the child that doesn't want to eat anything that's not potatoes right and now we have tacos and romaine boats and, and yeah, like, so it, it's small changes and yeah. that's the only way that you're going to get lasting change. It's really true. And the small changes that are satisfying and they give you results, right? So yes. it, 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 again, so what you've done is you've added to versus taking away, right? So you yeah. added to the original soda drink right? You added different things. You're like, okay, well, maybe kombucha and Coke aren't the best benefit or the best oh, taste. But kombucha okay. and ginger ale, right? Like, so. Yeah. So you found that kind of fix, right? So you're like, okay, so I'm going to add to the ginger ale, which means I'm going to end up drinking less ginger ale and more of the kombucha and the juice. Uh, right. And it's the same thing when you are building a plate, like consider your plate, your home base. When you get to your home base, you look at that plate, you go, where is my protein? And I'm talking three plates a day. This is like, this is, if I were just to send one message and, you know, this is the kind of message that is going to take those cravings and kick them to the curb, fill you up, give you energy to move through your day and give you the power to like have all of the food on the outside, which is one form 
go into the body and do all the different amazing things that it needs to do in, in that conversion process. Right. Um, and then the, you know, it's that protein piece. So if you have enough protein with your breakfast and so for breakfast, that could look like making say, you know, you want to have your steel cut oats. Okay. That's great. Well, read the, read the package. It's going to tell you how much protein is in one serving. I don't know what it would be. It depends on the kind of steel cut oats you're using then top it up, right? Like I add a little bit of cottage cheese or a little bit of, or maybe some egg whites, some, and I just make sure that I get that protein hit. And what that do, does, yeah, walnuts, exactly. Pumpkin seeds, hemp seeds, flax chia. But what that does is that, that hits, um, that hits the, uh, the fullness meter. So for example, if you were to take like three cups like this, one would be protein, one would be fat and one would be complex carbohydrate. If you fill those cups up with every meal, what ends up happening is you're on to the next thing. You're full for the next three, four hours and snacking kind of goes out the window. Cravings, you're like, oh yeah, I forgot. I was gonna have that chocolate chip cookie. No one said you couldn't have it. I'm not saying don't have it. I'm saying have it, but you know, have it after you kind of fill your buckets and see what happens. I, I've been working with a nutritionist for a few years now, and the original schedule was three meals and then three like snack things. And over the, over the process of the time, it has actually turned into four smaller meals every three hours or so. And I don't feel the need to go find stuff because I'm, I'm full and mm -hmm. with teenagers in the house, there's always garbage in the house, but if I have it up high where I can't see it or can't reach it, cause I'm a short bitch, but like, yeah. if I can't reach yeah. it and now I don't even have the desire to do that anymore. Like in the mm -hmm. beginning, I was like, where's the broom and I'm, you know, I'm doing dumb stuff, trying to get stuff down, but now I, I don't care about it anymore. It doesn't, it doesn't call to me anymore. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> Excuse me. That's exactly what will happen. And upstream from that is blood sugar regulation, right? So that's what's actually happening is the food that you're eating, that your nutritionist is working with you in terms of building these plates. Originally having the three meals and the three snacks was just about making sure that your blood sugar wasn't going too high and too low. Yep. Uh, and eventually you'll get to a place where, you know, with these four meals, for example, if that's where you found like, hey, this is a great set point right now for me. It the is. first meal, right? It all the first meal of your day is going to set you up pretty much whether or not are you going to the like, you know, the what do you call it, the six flags or are you going to ride around in a golf cart? Like if you're on the giant roller coaster, then you're on the giant roller coaster and it's pretty hard to get off of and that when I'm saying that I mean like blood sugar high, blood sugar drop, peaks, right? Peaks and valleys, yeah. Peaks and valleys. And uh once, you know, you start to also like really embody and embrace the idea around this, like looking at the plate and be like, so how is this going to affect my blood sugar? Like, is this going to put me on the roller coaster? Do I want to go on the roller coaster today? Maybe you do, uh, which means, you know, you're going to reach for a granola bar or something sugary and quick, like a quick hit um, a few, like two hours later. Like if you look at, I don't know how your school system is in the States, but here, you know, we have Say a classic example would be, you know, you start your kid with like, I don't know, a cereal, orange juice, maybe some toast and jam, pretty carby, pretty like no protein available in sight. Uh, it's really all sugar. You get them on that in the morning. Okay, great. Put them on a roller coaster and send them to school. Well, then we have recess, which is two hours later. Uh, and generally it's like a granola bar. Oh, great. Okay. Well, they were crashing, but now we've just given them more sugar. So now they're going to get back on the roller coaster poor teachers, bless the teachers. We love them. But guess what? Now comes lunch. So here's lunch, but it's generally like a sandwich. Maybe it's a piece of fruit. Maybe it's some apple juice. Maybe it's a cookie back on the roller coaster ride. Congratulations. Then they get to go home and they are fidgety. They're picky. Their brains, you know, they're exhausted. They're yeah. hyperactive, whatever it is. So absolutely. absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And Not we are in similar success. things. Yeah. Not, and not, and really it's not even because we didn't, it's not, we, it's not our fault. We didn't know that we've just been marketed to in a way that says have this healthy cereal, right? It is like the perfect way to start the day. Um, it's garbage. And it is just give them a chocolate bar. You might as well just give your kids a chocolate bar for breakfast. 
and for oh, lunch yeah. and for recess. If if that's, you know, I mean, if you wanted to get down to brass tacks and like look at realistically what's happening, that's what's happening. Yeah, I, I, you know, I, it, it's just horrific. The, the whole premise of the, that, that's just going to irritate me. So we, we, I, don't, I don't want to circle back to that. <laughs> I don't it need just, you to get just... irritated. But now that you know it, right? And any of the listeners here that are joining us on this right. podcast, it's just food for thought, literally like, huh, well, maybe if I change this, the, 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 what I'm feeding and in what order, do it, measure it, follow your metrics. Yeah. Like what's different? What's changed? You've done that. You're like walking proof that you can make these tiny little adjustments and like, suddenly boom. Within, within reach, within reach are, 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 are the nuts. So if yeah. I'm going to have, if I need a, a whatever, the the nuts are closer than the yeah. not so healthy stuff exactly you know? yeah they're literally right here yeah and it, it it starts with your mindset if you get your mindset correct then you can work on all of the aspects of your life that you want to improve and doing it incrementally is the only way to get there successfully yes i know people quit smoking cold turkey and never turn back to it i get that that's a thing but that that is not the norm as outside of the norm and i'm not saying you can't do that but you're less likely to be able to do that yeah for sure and you know generally if someone is going to go cold turkey hopefully they'll have support because that's the other key huge key you know player in the trifecta like for me it's science strategy and then support is like the foundation. And without the support in any of these endeavors that we do, um, by design, we're not meant to do things alone. You know, like cells, a, a single cell alone in a Petri dish, dish will die. You give that cell a friend, great. Now it's, now it's a Just party. like sheep. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, exactly. For me, the three pillars are mindsets, mm -hmm. having the right support network, and then deciding what alternative wellness modalities you want to use in addition to what your oncologist is telling you mind body spirit like that is the holistic thing yeah. that's just you have to, you you have to get it all together and, and and in harmony yeah and exploring options like the alternative modalities uh you know western thinking in western medicine is very allopathic right like we're going to focus on the one thing and the one thing only like you have a broken arm i'm just going to look at the broken arm i'm not going to look at anything else going on and i think that's wrong you you need to have the holistic with the allopathic and i i definitely think that there are instances where allopathic doesn't even need to be invited to the to the party absolutely right. mm. but you know with cancer, I definitely think that allopathic needs to be invited to the party. So and what allopathic means is traditional American medicine. That's basically what that means. So I, I like harmony. I, I like to use both and it works for me. And then when you're, when you're picking the modalities that you want to do, it's, literally it's based on your into your body knows mm. what it needs just listen to it and i know that we're conditioned not to do that we're, we're trained not to do that from go you yeah. know and it's not our parents fault because they were trained the same way so listening to what your what your body tells you is super important i mean it's literally why i'm alive I yes. listened to what my body was telling me when, when I knew there was something going on with my body and there was no cancer markers in my blood. Like oncology, like I spoke to a, a, a hema, basically a blood oncologist because I had a, a recent cancer scare. And when I told her that originally there was, there was no cancer markers in my blood, she honestly looked like I hit her in the face with a four by four. Like she just fully expected there to be markers in my blood i was like they took over 10 pounds of cancer out of my body and there was there was no indication other than me fucking knowing there was something wrong with my body they had mm. to do a dnc to find my cancer wow all of the other testing came back fine or inconclusive mm. yeah but i knew there was something wrong and my gynecologist believed me 
I would have found a different one if she didn't. Like, it's that simple. But Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. advocating for yourself and listening to what your body is telling you. Oh, it's golden. It's the first thing. It really is the first thing. Because Mm -hmm. your, your, your body is always talking to you. And we're conditioned not to listen to what it's saying. And we really need to sit and start listening to our body because we know how to feed it. Mm-hmm. We know. It's so, we know. Exactly. And, you know, symptoms are, are the language of the body, right? Symptoms. And so, like Oprah says, it starts as a little baby whisper, right? Like you have a little sniffle. I don't know, maybe take some more vitamin D, maybe take a little oil of oregano, you know, like don't maybe go right for the cold medicine, just like listen to the whisper. And then if you ignore the whisper, then it becomes like, you know, a little bit louder, a little bit louder, eventually becomes a shout. And then eventually it becomes a smack right upside the head. Uh, It's the only way that the body has of communicating to us on the outside is a symptom. And you're thinking like there is something amiss here. There's something that is not right. And even though nobody sort of in this allopathic model believes me, I believe me. And that is what that advocacy and that listening is what saved your life. I I have a saying, I, you know, medical practice is a practice. I understand it's a very educated practice, but I live here 24 mm. seven. So when I'm telling you there's something wrong with this, you need to respect the fact that I know there's something wrong here. Just like I respect the fact that you went to many years of, of schooling to get your degrees. Like there mm-hmm. needs, you need to have a relationship with your providers and, and they need to actually listen to you. And I understand that there's a lot of reasons why they don't necessarily have time to do that because of insurance and 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 all like there's problems. It's so, super problematic. However, you're allowed to fire your practitioner and go find a new one. You're allowed to make them put in the chart that they were unwilling to do the testing you requested because they they were unwilling. And you you can advocate for yourself. You can call the insurance companies and tell the insurance company that the the provider did not provide the services Mm -hmm. and that you don't think that they should be paid. Like you have these rights and people don't realize that they have rights. You can totally okay. Yeah. That's an interesting, you know what? And listen, I send, we send clients over the border sometimes to get testing because here it's like, you know, that's a real like keeper of the gate kind of thing around getting lab work uh, for basic things. Like I'm not talking like huge diagnosis, like that is not the world that I live in. However, if I want to know what, you know, if I, if I want to do a deeper dive and get to the bottom of something and the, you know, a, a GP of a client is saying, well, I absolutely flat out refuse to test for that. It's a one hour drive over to Bellingham and there are like, they're like 7-Elevens over there. Like you can just walk in and get blood work done. And yeah, it's out of pocket, but you know, there's that you pay now or you pay later. And generally later, it's more expensive if there is a health condition that is going to derail you. And so, uh, you know, the blood doesn't lie. It, I do believe in the test don't guess model a hundred percent. Uh, especially when we're dealing with sort of, you know, sort of more nefarious, uh, deleterious kind of health uh, challenges. It's, it's technical in, in, in like, in my case, it was not, but yes, right. I, blood work is super important. I, I, absolutely. I, and I, the, the pay now pay later thing, I like, I had insurance while I was going through my chemo and radiation and my, the whole cancer activity. And I was super lucky I stopped calculating it when the insurance company paid out, not was billed, but paid out over a million dollars. And I just, and I I was not finished with my stuff. So there's no way I could have afforded that without insurance. Like Mm. it's, it's insane. So insurance companies, the whole medical system really needs a, a, a revamping from, from nose to toes. And, uh, the more we advocate, the more we talk about it, the more likely it'll happen. Totally, totally. And that's it. Like, those are the kind of the big things that we're talking about here, right? It's it's using the strategy. So it's those baby small steps. It's uh, getting the support in order to take those steps and continue on that journey. And advocacy, right? That's huge. Like, we don't have a language around asking for help 
at the best of times, let alone sitting in front of, you know, a doctor who definitely there's that power play that whether it's intentional or not exists. And, and, you know, if you're going in and you're, you're afraid because you, you're not, you don't, you're not feeling well, and you don't know what's going on. You're not getting the answers you want and deserve, like you deserve to get the right answers. Um, that is all terrifying and all scary. And, uh, you know, um, I actually have a script for advocacy that I share with my clients when I'm preparing them to go and face their GP to ask for a simple routine thyroid test. Yeah, I, I shouldn't have to fight my my providers. They they should be trying to to help me figure out what's going on. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Right. And that's why women, like that's why you doing the work that you do is so important because you're that bridge, right? Like I will you will help women that are in any situation or people that are in any situation where they're stuck to take the next small step. Like here is a door that we can look in. Here's like we don't have to go into the room. We can just peek in the door and we don't have to furnish it yet. We just have to look in the room and see if it's possible for us to enter it. Absolutely. I, I, you know, I also recommend highly that you prepare in advance. You write all your questions down because when you're there, you're going to forget that you had them. Exactly. And, you know, you can record your conversation with your doctor. I mean, mm. in some states, you, there's one party laws where you can just record and in other states, you have to get their permission. So you'd have to figure that out where, you, where you're located. But, uh, and I know that there are HIPAA compliant apps out there. I don't know off the top of my head what they are that will that you can do the recording on. But if you're the patient, you're the one that's allowed to break HIPAA. Like people don't quite understand how it, it's to protect you. But if you're willing to share, like, like if you're willing to have it recorded because you want the recording, that's, mm-hmm. that's your right. Like, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. so that you can know what's going on. I created a, a medical binder for myself. It had all my, all my information in it, all the lab work, all, all of the, all, like, I was through chemo. I couldn't remember what I ate for breakfast and I ate the same damn thing every day. Like, and I carried it everywhere I went. And, you know, when I went in for my blood, blood work, I always made sure that I would drink, uh, you know, half a gallon of water before I went in because I had no freaking veins, veins. because mm. of chemo. So it was super painful if I didn't drink water before I went, you know, like a half an hour before I went in. It was, it was ridiculous. Having that binder really made it easier for me to go through the diagnosis itself on one page was a listing of all of the appointments so that like I could look at this page and 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 tell whatever provider I was at who I saw last and when it was where the labs work were and then then it had all like then you know then it was contact information for all of the different places and then it was a running discussion of all of the discussions that I had with the providers so I what are we changing in in the medication? What are we doing here? How are we handling this thing? Yeah, golden. I I mean yes, and that's the that's the I have a similar binder that I give my clients. Right, I request that they do it. I used to, I mean back in the old days when we were in paper, um, you know, I I had sections where one was lab work and dated and get a highlighter out and highlight anything that's flagged and then. Three months later, when you go for follow-up blood work, go back to those same tests, and highlight the it. ones, and then let's start to create a graph and see what's working and what's not. And that that particular modality can be applied to any the any of the things in life that we're trying to do. Like if I'm trying to make a behavior different, if I'm trying to do something differently, whether it's how I feed myself, how I advocate for myself, you know, whatever, how I get the raise at work, whatever it is systems are what gets us out of the situation that we're in and into a different place. Because you're going to remember it differently, but if you wrote it down and you can look at the empirical data and yeah. see where the things were, you can make effective changes based on that. And exactly. Like, like once the, once the inflammation goes down and the pain in the shoulder leaves, as an example, who's going to remember the pain? I'm not going to be like, oh, yes, I'm going to make a really clear effort to remember that I had like lower back pain or whatever for 20 years. Forget it. The pain is gone. I'm out. So you're not going to remember it. 
And it's not that you, the, the important piece there, the message and the takeaway is not like, I want you to remember the pain. What I want you to do is have these like ways of, rem- of celebrating the wins, of celebrating the shifts of the, all of the work, like, you know, the Coca-Cola journey to the kombucha tea cranberry journey was, it's a huge shift and it's a, win. it's a win. And if you didn't remember that you were just, you know, that you drank Coca-Cola for 20 years or whatever, uh, this wouldn't be a special, it wouldn't have the same meaning. It wouldn't be like, yes, this is a win. And yes, I am driving the car and yes, I am making a difference in my life. And that's a mindset piece, right? That's a win. Like if you're on a winning team, they have trophies for reasons. Yes. And we circle back to mindset because. Yeah. 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 I, I, because honestly, like people are like, no, this is the most important thing. I'm like, nope. Mindset comes first. Mindset comes first. And I like, I believe that 98% of the reason I'm still here is the mindset and the rest of it had to do with having the right support network and, you know, Mm -hmm. the right treatment plan and all of my beautiful additional wellness modalities that I was doing. You know, the oncologist told me I wasn't allowed to do the herbalism. Okay, that's fine. He's like, I don't care if you smell stuff or walk on grass or whatever else you're doing. That's, that's fine. I'm like, fantastic. And that was enough alignment for me. And so that's that's what we did we did the detoxifying baths we did uh, reiki we did aromatherapy we did all these beautiful flower essences i you know i had 30 plants in my bedroom and i shut the door so hyperoxidant oxygenated sleeping environment do i know that it helped it helped because i believed it helped so like and what a gift what a gift like in a way, would you have exposed yourself to 30 different plants oxygenating your room when you slept at night? Would you have exposed yourself to aromatherapy, to walking barefoot on the grass? Like, you know, in that mindset piece, it's like, well, what has this experience offered me as well, right? Like, yes, it's 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 shitty and nobody wants to go through it. And you would not, if you had the choice, you wouldn't be like, yes, I'm going to choose that again. Um, however, there is some real beauty in what you're saying right now. When you are in the middle of fighting for your life, whatever the disease is, and you're sitting there and you're treated as your diagnosis Mm. and all, everything that you do be and are is about living through the experience the small joys that you get to have I I slept 20 hour days I honestly I was a 300 pound cat like just all I did was sleep and and eat and 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 go to my bathroom and and then and then go to my treatments and do all of that and everything was just cancer 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 and that that didn't work for me so now there's you know walking barefoot in the grass under the full moon and uh, you know being slathered in mud and wrapped in saran wrap I'd say wow (laughs) so that I can have my little detoxifying bath Mm -hmm. right like my Mm -hmm. mud bath and 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 laying down on on the massage table and and having uh, the raindrop technique put on my back with with whatever carrier oil and like oregano and uh, lavender and whatever else is in the like raindrop technique and and then smelling like an Italian dish when I left. But like, you, yeah, all of that was important because it helped save the sanity. Mm-hmm. It, add, it added quality versus quantity. It, it yeah. added to the quality of the life that I was living at that time. And when you're stuck in that, and I, and I do mean stuck when you're, when you're stuck in it, cause you're going through it and it's not like you can opt out. Right. I mean, I guess you can, you could decide to die. That's the opt out. But if you're a fighter and you decide you don't want to opt, opt out and you, you, so you're committed to doing this, you hit a point where you believe that it is always going to be cancer and, and, and that there's not going to be an, the other side of it. 
here I am sitting 16 years post the original diagnosis. And uh, there have been months where I have forgotten that I'm a survivor. Like, I mean, not now because I'm advocating and stuff like, but there, there, there were definitely times when I was like, oh yeah, that, that was a thing that happened in my life. Mm. And so it's really hard to imagine what the after is going to be when you're stuck in the, in, in the, in the now. And what I can say to that for people who are experiencing that right now is there, there is an after there, 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 there is, there is the option for having beautiful days where you don't remember that you were a diagnosis. That is stunning. That is beautiful. Wow. It was hard. It was super hard. And, mm. uh, nobody ever talked about the fact that I had expiration date or they didn't talk about if I was going to die. Nobody was mourning me while I was standing in front of them. What they did when I was not around, I don't know. And I've never asked because it doesn't matter. Because mm-hmm. it doesn't matter. Mm-hmm. I knew mm-hmm. that I was going to do everything within my power to survive it. And some people don't. Some people choose not to fight the fight. And that's that's difficult to watch when your loved one has decided they're not going to. But you you didn't walk their walk and you can't you can't inflict your wants onto them. They're allowed to make their own decisions whether you like them or not. And I, I've spoken about this a few times and support and love is what you offer to your to your loved one when they're going through the hard time. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. that's 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 how you help you ask yeah. them what you can do for them because for everybody it's different like that's totally the number one question that i get from people who support right is well i don't know what to say i don't know how to help them i'm like well have you had a conversation with them have you asked them well i feel funny about that well you need to ask them how they want to be helped because mm-hmm. i can't answer that i know how i want to be helped when i'm going through something like that Mm-hmm. everybody navigates their journey differently and it's right for them it's yeah that's it that's a that's a uh in the helpers right like even in that binder that you talk about having a section where it's sort of like a free flow like these are the things i wish i had and that might be if i can't answer you i don't have i can't remember what i want i don't know what i want um, there might be, you know, five things that I wrote down and under like, you know, my, my riff category and just like go in there and see if there's anything that speaks to you. Like maybe I need some good magazines. Maybe like, I can't read a novel, but I could definitely flip through a vanity fair. Right. I could use a satin pillow. I could use, uh, you know, I mean, I don't, we had, we had, I have several friends, you know, one and two that are, will affect us that have cancer. And, one woman said, I want to have a comfortable bed. And boy, did we make her a comfortable bed. We made her the most beautiful bedroom that she could. She's like, I'm going to be in this room for 20 hours a day. Like you said, you know, and I just, I'd like to have a nice bedding. And so we did it. Button down pajamas because of where the port is it, mm-hmm. over the head. Pajamas don't work. So you, so you need button down pajamas. Like, and this is like, the fuck would you know that? Like, how would you know that? And unless, unless, right? Like, yeah. and a thousand percent take that stool softener, stool softener the night before you go in for the abdominal surgery. I promised you. <laughs> Pulling diamond hard rock, oh, diamond hard fucking poop out of your butt after yeah. your surgery, your abdominal surgery is not a fun thing. Exactly. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Like, is there a list? Is there a list somewhere? I mean, if not, there should be, I'm sure there's lots of I'm working lists, on but... it. I'm working on it. Yeah. I'm actually, I'm, I'm, I'm writing a book and I, it's going to be my story, your story type where mm. I write an experience and then leave space for your experience. Amazing. Because I, I didn't, I, I did. I wrote stuff down during it. I can't find it. I don't know where it is. I don't know if I'm supposed to know where it is, but the, the act of journaling I'm not consistent whatsoever, but the act of journaling is super important, especially when you're going through something like this. 15 years later, you're going to want to know how you were feeling. I promise you that. Yeah. 
absolutely. That's amazing. That's totally amazing. Um, yeah. Wow. Really cool. I mean, like people are lucky to have you as like on their team, you know, I mean, I feel like that's the, the little ideas and taking your own personal life experience and what worked for you and talking to others and what worked for them and what didn't work for them and having it in like one place where you and your, your healthcare, you know, your support network can go and uh, pluck what works for them, pluck the petals that work for you. Yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. All right, Incredible. Leslie, it has been amazing having you on the show. Did you mention that you had a gift for the audience? Well, the gift that I like to offer is me. It's some time. You know, some time. I find that generally when I connect with somebody, it's over a cup of tea, either it's through Zoom or it's in person. Um, I have discovery calls that I offer through my clinic, which I can share, that you can share in the show notes. Uh, it's Absolutely. A, it's a 50 minute discovery and you just come to me and, you know, nutrition is my game, but also behavior design, any of those things that people are working through, I'm happy to have discussions and see if, if there's some way that I can be of service. Absolutely. Thank you. It has been an absolute delight to talk to you today. Thank you so much for having me. And I hope we weren't too all over the place because you and I just definitely riffed and we went to all the different places but my audience is used to my tree branches and me going all over the place like I don't I try but you know there are so many beautiful soap soap boxes to stand on um in your wellness journey that sometimes it's really hard for me to focus on one per episode so nobody's expecting that at this point amazing <laughs> they, okay, are, great. they might be in the wrong spot if they, they might be totally totally well we can always circle back and uh like elaborate or you know on any of the other soapboxes so i'm happy to to have yes, several chats absolutely yes Wonderful. we will do this again thank Gorgeous. you thank right. you goodbye everybody